Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you very much for attending and welcome to this meeting of the Strategy and Resources Policy Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Tom Hunt. I'm the leader of the council. The meeting today is open to the public uh, and there's no items that contain exempt information. Uh, the meeting will be webcast and the recording will be available to view later through the council's website. Uh, it's also possible that Sheffield Live TV will record and rebroadcast this meeting. We've received 17 questions from seven members of the public today. Um, council procedure rules allow for a period of 30 minutes for public questions. However, I'm proposing that we extend the allocated time for public questions to be up to one hour, and I will ask the meeting to agree this when we get to item four in the agenda. Uh, please can I request that mobiles are switched to silent mode so as not to distort, get my words out, disturb the conduct of the meeting. Uh, there's no fire test planned for today. Um, if there is an emergency evacuation, uh, please follow instructions from the town hall staff and the assembly point is in Tudor Square. Um, I will now go around and ask each member of the Strategy and Resources Committee to introduce themselves, and then I'll go around and introduce all of the officers who are here. Um, so, uh, on my left. Councillor Angela Ardenso, member for Broomhill and Shallowell, and chair of the Adult Health and Social Care Policy Committee. Thanks. Um, Douglas Johnson, Councillor for City Ward and chair of the Housing Committee. Councillor Zahira Nas, Councillor for the Dawn Award and Chair of the Finance Committee. Councillor Dawn Dale, Councillor for Shy Green and Brightside Ward and Chair of Education, Children and Families Policy Committee. Fran Belbin, Councillor for Firth Park Ward and Deputy Leader. Councillor Ben Miskell, uh, Councillor for Park and Arbathorn Ward and Chair of the Transport, Regeneration and Climate Committee. Um, Councillor Joe Otten, Liberal Democrat member for Dawn Totley and Chair of Waste and Street Team. Councillor Shafat Mohammed, Ecclesall Ward. Martin Smith, Dawn Totley Ward, Chair of the Economic Development, Skills and Culture Committee. Yeah, uh, Richard Williams, member for Stannington Ward and Chair of Communities, Parks and Leisure. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I now ask the officers to introduce themselves, starting on my left of here. I'm Kate Joseph, Chief Executive. Claire Taylor, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, James Anderson. Okay. James Anderson, Director of Policy and Democratic Engagement. David Hollis, Interim General Counsel. Craig Rogerson, Democratic Services. Uh, Lucy Hayes, Street Tree Response. Richard A. Downing for Streets and Regulations. Thanks very much. Um, and if I could ask people to just switch the phones on to silent, that would be helpful. Um, okay, so um, item one is apologies. Do we have any apologies or for absence that need to be recorded? Non chair. Thank you. Um, item two is any uh, exclusion of the public and press for parts of this meeting? And the answer is no on that. Um, third is declarations of interest. Are there any members who wish to declare an interest in any of items on business on the agenda? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so item four, public questions uh, relating to the issue to be discussed today. Um, and as I mentioned already, we have received 17 questions from seven members of the public on the issues before us. Um, with regard to the council constitution and procedure rules, um, can I please seek the arrangement of the agreement rather of the meeting that we extend the question period to one hour? Thank you, everybody. Um, right, so the public um, questioners will be coming to give their question from, I believe, the table just in front. Um, could I first invite uh, Russell Johnson to join us? Good 
Good afternoon, everybody. Congratulations, Councillor Hunt, on your election as leader. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to bask in the bosom of democracy in the town hall. Not very long questions, you'll be pleased to hear. Number one, may I express profound disappointment that my council has once again demonstrated its lack of imagination and failure to seize opportunities provided by the Locock narrative and the catalogue of expensive blunders since that scandal to learn lessons. This is demonstrated in the very revealing statement, and I quote from the paper presenting to present to this meeting, this report recommends treating the inquiry report as the definitive version of the truth. Now, I'll just pause a moment while you grasp the import of that statement. The sheer audacity of it is it's mind-boggling. Question. Does this almost Orwellian assertion mean that SCC believes that there are no more truths, in inverted commas, to be exposed, and so expects to put Locock to bed as soon as possible course challenge and carry on much as before. Lest SCC believes that their response report ends this matter, may I just add a couple of points. Those are, Bevan Britton stated, people here will remember, that they, the lawyers, had received insufficient information regarding the misuse of LPP in emails. That's the first point. Secondly, that before retiring, a senior officer, we all know who that is, but I won't name him, of course, deleted many probably relevant emails before the inquiry commenced. So how could the inquiry have been at all complete? And also that a number of key witnesses around the scandal failed to give evidence to Sir Mark at all. Thus, I put it to you, Sir Mark's report is rendered incomplete at best. It most certainly is not the definitive truth. Question two. And if anybody, if people, that's not framed as a question, but if anybody would like to comment on that narrative of mine, then I would be most grateful. Question two. Sir Mark committed that all legally allowable documents that he had used in his inquiry would be deposited in an archive, city archive, in perpetuity, in recognition of the importance of the debacle in the history of Sheffield governance. However, I found out from Pete Evans, who is the archivist in charge of this operation, that only 130 documents of an extraordinary one million, which is unbelievable, we've heard, uh, considered by Sir Mark, have been deposited post-inquiry. 130 only. Question one, why so few? Two, who selected those 130 and what criteria did they apply? Three, why is the street tree archive particularly difficult to navigate, even for those of us with some knowledge of the subject? It's not well designed. Four, is this to be seen as accurately illustrating SCC's claimed new culture of openness and transparency? Or is it something else? Question three. Having carefully read the report to the committee, and indeed the inquiry report itself, I note a glaring omission. Namely, no stated intention to reimburse legal defence costs incurred by those citizens victimised as a result of the injunction. And I note during the report to this committee, the word unwise regarding the injunction is used a number of times. I'd go further. It was illegitimate. The court was misled. Sir Mark said so. Will, question one, part one. Will the leader and chief executive today commit to correcting this apparent error? If not, please would they explain. Finally, question four. Please would Councillor Hunt explain why some elected members in his party who were cabinet members during the scandal described by Sir Mark remain in the council at all? I do realize that their positions have changed, but they remain as elected members seeking to govern this city. It's a scandal, an absolute scandal. One of those people who was in cabinet during the debacle is actually in a fairly senior position now. I asked Councillor Hunt to comment on this, having particular regard to the 
unanimously approved motion at the extraordinary council meeting recently and the imperative for sound democratic governance and accountability. And I hope that applies to the Labour Party as it should to the broader council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Um, so I will now read out answers to your four questions. Um, entirely up to you. In answer to your first question, the goals of the inquiry were to support the ongoing recovery in Sheffield from the dispute and to draw conclusions and make recommendations designed to help minimize the risk of the dispute re-emerging in the future. The inquiry report delivered against both of these goals and the council has committed on multiple occasions to take action to meet both the word and the spirit of the recommendations. This will mean we make meaningful change to ensure a dispute of this nature can never arise again. As Sir Mark said to the extraordinary general meeting of the council in this chamber on 10th of May, it is always possible to find further questions to pursue. Having invested significantly in a thorough inquiry, we have established what went wrong in the past. We now need to focus on learning the lessons and ensuring that we manage things well in the future. As the report before this committee today sets out, we will be working with the Local Government Association, Information Commissioner's Office and our auditors, as well as liaising with the Local Government Ombudsman. This shows our commitment to openness and to welcoming scrutiny. The report also gives clear deadlines reaching into the future so that anyone can track our progress and hold us to account against a very comprehensive plan. In response to your second question, the Sheffield Street Tree Inquiry was an independent inquiry hosted by the legal firm Waitmans to ensure its independence from all stakeholders, including the council. The inquiry report itself is the final description of what the inquiry found and the evidence on which it made its observations and conclusions. As it was an independent inquiry, the council did not receive any information beyond the inquiry report describing the ways of working of the inquiry or its decision making or receive from the inquiry materials that it did not submit. As the inquiry report methodology in Annex B of the inquiry report sets out, the council, as you mentioned, provided the inquiry with over 1 million documents. These included email inboxes, cloud storage, digital files, hard copy files, and the entire street tree archive. The council uh, submitted these complete and unredacted. This was to ensure that the inquiry was given access to all relevant material. As a result, the vast majority of this information was found by the inquiry not to be relevant to its work. Based on the inquiry report, where there is evidence not already on the Street Tree Archive, it will be added in the next 16 weeks. The material generated by the inquiry, progress reports, public hearings, the final report, are already in the archive. Guidance on navigating the Street Tree Archive is available on the archive website and through a video on the Sheffield Archive's YouTube channel. In response to your third question, the report commits the council to reimbursing the financial court orders arising from the injunctions. This was done during April. This action already goes beyond what was recommended by Sir Mark Lowcock in the inquiry report. We did this so that the council did not financially benefit from the outcome of an unwise course of action and as a mark of fairness between those who had and had not paid those court orders. For the avoidance of doubt, we have not reimbursed any legal costs. We will not be seeking to go further than this, as further reimbursements were not recommended by the inquiry, and the council has not financially benefited from any individual advice that residents sought. In response to your first, fourth question, at the extraordinary meeting of the City Council on May the 10th, we heard from Sir Mark. He offered us his view that he is sceptical of the view of relitigating re things that happened in the dispute and cautioned that this is not likely to help us move forward. I agree. Having identified a number of lessons from the dispute, the task now is to learn from them and to look forward. As the new leader, I am focused on that task. I expect that all elected members in my party and in others and all officers understand the seriousness of what happened during this dispute and commit to work together to ensure that a dispute of this magnitude can never happen again. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I will now invite 
um, Isabel O'Leary to ask her questions. Thanks, Isabel. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that a lot of work has gone into the report being presented today and that the officers involved are hoping that this committee will rubber stamp the report and its actions, thus declaring the response to the LOCOP report complete. However, I have the following questions. Will the committee add an apology to the people of Sheffield for the public money wasted on the street tree scandal? This amounts to at least 2.12 million so far, plus any money spent on non-disclosure agreements. I haven't included the 200,000 that this committee is being asked to approve today to action LOCOP's recommendations, as these are positive actions rather than wasteful ones. I've also not included the estimated 40 million pounds of lost asset value of healthy trees that were unnecessarily felled. My second question. The report being considered today suggests actions to improve future standards of governance. Will the committee today agree that there is a need for accountability to be demonstrated now and in the future? One action would be for the committee to demonstrate this by reiterating the amendment that was passed at the ECM on the 10th of May. As a reminder, this said that the council believes that for individuals who were council cabinet members in the civic years 2015-16 to 2017-18, resignation from public office would be an appropriate indication of acceptance of responsibility for harms caused. My third question. The report being considered today asks for funding to be allocated to improve the management of contracts and council services. And this report also recommends a reduction in silo thinking and an increase in cross-departmental working. It also mentions the need for biodiversity and ecological impact to be considered across all decision making. So will this committee therefore consider allocating funds to strengthen the council's ecology unit to allow in-house professional ecological advice to be sought for decisions taken by the council across many areas? A strengthened in-house team will have an overview of the potential impact of decisions in one area on another and facilitate more joined up thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, so to answer your first question, um, the, the council does not recognize the figure of 2.12 uh, 2 million given in the question. There have been a lot of incorrect financial figures shared during the course of the dispute. Um, for instance, the inquiry clarified the misunderstanding around payments to Amy for delays due to the work of the independent tree panel, making clear that these were done on a no worse or no better basis, which means that Amy did not receive a large financial benefit for delays. Likewise, the council does not recognize the reference to non-disclosure agreements. During any large scale program, there will be disagreements about what constitutes a good use of money. However, during the dispute, there were unarguable actions taken and opportunities missed, which we now regret. Some of these may have saved the council money had they been successful. Money may also have been saved had we changed course sooner. For this, we apologize. I want to address directly the loss of trees. In our overarching apology, we apologize for deciding on the removal of healthy trees, which should still be standing today. These healthy trees were important to residents, are important to residents, and gave communities and the city benefits which were overlooked. It is a source of regret that this valuable asset was damaged through our actions. That is why in the report, we dedicate a substantial section to the management of streets ahead and ensuring that the future success of the Sheffield Street Tree Partnership is ensured. These actions should prevent us from making mistakes of this kind on ecological issues. I do hope that it is clear from our apology that we recognize that we got much of the handling of this dispute wrong and that we apologize unreservedly. To answer your second question, 
Six weeks ago in this chamber, we heard from Sir Mark at the extraordinary meeting of the City Council. His words are worth repeating. He offered us his view that he is skeptical of the value of relitigating things that happened in the dispute and he cautioned that this is not likely to help us move forward. As I mentioned earlier, I do agree with this. Having identified a number of lessons from the dispute, the task now is to learn from them, implement actions to embed that learning and to look forward. Today's report is an opportunity to come together to do that. I do not believe that it serves our aim of seeking reconciliation by looking back. The path to the events described in Sir Mark's report were years, if not decades, in the making. As such, if you were so inclined, it would be possible to look much further back than 2015 and apportion blame to members and officers for harms that were later caused. I do not suggest that this will be a fruitful course of action. A focus of the LOCOT report and the actions that we are discussing today is to support reconciliation and to help the city recover from the dispute. We do so with a clear-eyed focus on what went wrong and a determination never to let that happen again. On the question of accountability, the report that we will shortly consider sets out 36 actions and their monitoring and accountability arrangements to implement the recommendations of the inquiry. These are set out in the report and summarised in Annex A. This committee, this council, will be accountable for ensuring that those recommendations are met. On your third question, the council is committed to ensuring that we have the right resource in the right place at the right time, and as part of our usual business planning processes, we will look carefully at the needs of every service in the council, including the ecology unit, and we will make decisions about the right level of investment to ensure that our interests can be managed within the tight fiscal envelope that we face. Thank you. Uh, the third person to ask a question today is Calvin Payne. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the things we've had the chance to look at in, in the last uh, week or so before this meeting is obviously comparing the proposed resources um, that's going um, to be uh, uh, discussed today. And we've got now sums of money, time scales, resources that are going to be put into to writing the, the wrong. And I remember the past, and I remember the, um, some of the money that's been mentioned by, uh, by Isabel about what that money was spent on. Because in the past, money was spent very differently. There wasn't very limited and de definite sums of money to be spent. When it comes to evidence gatherers following female protesters home, to find out where they lived and worked and where their children went to school. You had lots of money to do so. When it came to paying a barrister, a QC, 15,000 pounds a day to cross-examine myself, Dave Dilner and Alison Till in the first injunction trial, you had lots of money. And Sheffield Council didn't employ a local firm when it took us on legally. It went to the very top and employed some of the most expensive anti-protest legal representation. Who, amongst others who had represented, um, who had, um, acted against the Occupy movement, for example. These were people that you went to when you had some troublemakers to deal with. 15,000 pounds a day. So I'd like to compare that to the sums of money you've got on your sheets today. There are public purse constraints. Of course they are. You're about to tell me there are. And I, t and I understand that. I just wish the same constraints could have been in place in 2016, 17, 18. When it came to destroying the lives of people here, you had an apparently bottomless pit of money. But when it comes to putting things right and putting right the wrongs of the past and moving forward to re-establishing trust and the things that we have heard a lot about since the inquiry report, I think those resources need to be proportionate to the resources you threw at making that wrong in the first place. And they are not. They are woefully not. So my question is, do the council consider that the resources allocated for, quote, mitigating the ongoing impact on those convicted under the injunction to be commensurate with the sums it spent pursuing those same campaigners throughout 2017-18. Thank you, Mr. Payne, and thank you for coming to this committee today, having spoken about the challenges 
that you face as a result of being convicted under the injunction um, when you, you spoke about that at the EGM in May. So thank you for your comment. The resources allocated in the report intend to support the council to work with a small number of people affected and to do everything possible to mitigate the ongoing impact. We cannot say what the final cost of doing so will be at this point as it will be dependent upon those individual circumstances. The report has estimated a budget to support this work. If it is not found to be sufficient, I will ask the legal team to bring further advice to this committee on what else is needed. Could I please ask John Johnson to come up and ask his questions? Afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much. Just hope the technology doesn't let me down again. <clears throat> so, my question is, with regard to the report before you today, you have a fantastic opportunity to address Sir Mark's recommendation, particularly number eight, Sustain the emphasis Sheffield City Council has recently placed on partnerships, local engagement and consultation and consider what more it needs to do to ensure that a culture conducive to that is fully embedded. Throughout the extraordinary meeting, the AGM and in this report, we've seen and heard the words openness, honesty and transparency repeated again and again. And that's welcome. But in order to implement those aims, to move away from the bunker mentality, which I'm afraid I do see hints of here today, uh, and fulfill Article, um, article 1.03 of the Council's own constitution, and I'm happy to refer to that if anybody's not familiar with it, you now have a chance to build on the avowed success of the Street Tree Partnership and embrace collaborative working with informed, eager, constructive and positive members of the Sheffield public to help ensure that recommendation B of today's report can be seen through to its conclusion in 2025. Not only does this offer come at no cost to the council, it can add hugely to the process of rebuilding trust, contribute ideas, be a sounding board for proposals and potentially save further costly mistakes. Therefore, my question is, will the council through this committee accept an offer of help in navigating the momentous and potentially beneficial changes sought by today's report from a group of volunteer citizens, not necessarily those of us here today, there's many, many more who are happy to get involved, who share your belief that together we get things done and who always believe we can do better. And I would just like to add to that, if I may, very briefly. Um, it seems painful to you to actually have us here today and have the temerity to ask questions, which you then have days to spin the answers to, and I'm sure I'm about to get fobbed off on mine as well. Um, you work for us, you are elected from us into trusted positions or are paid to do them to run the third biggest local authority in the country. I had a lovely lunch with Fran the other day uh, where we discussed some of this and that meeting finished with a suggestion from her that we consider a similar kind of scrutiny function. I don't know what it is, I haven't got any particular ideas about it, that's something we could discuss. Um, but we came out of that meeting with that as a as what I thought at that point was a potential way forward. If you don't see fit to accept offers of help in the huge challenges, it's further evidence of the paternalistic top-down problems which led to Locock and will do again. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, we do want to work with the people of Sheffield and we want to build in a culture of engagement into everything that we do. I'm now going to read out an answer for you because I think it's important that people see, hear the full answer, um, particularly those people who will be watching it back later. But I will just emphasise that point that this is our aim to build a culture of engagement into everything that we're doing and to work with people The Council's approach to engagement, as you and others and all of us know, have pointed out and the report acknowledges, is inconsistent with pockets of good practice, others bits less so. Where big organisations like councils have issues with engagement, the problem isn't only setting up the right forums, boards or consultation functions. The issues tend to run deeper than that, and I think that is something that we would all agree on, and be about the organisation's culture, climate and capacity. In other words, 
having a clear vision about what kind of engagement is appropriate where and the time and the skills to do it right. Acknowledging that the council is not there on all these factors yet led us to the recommended actions of paragraph 90B in the report, which commit the council to develop plans to embed a climate of engagement throughout the organization. The report before us today challenges the council to think strategically about what is needed where and how we create the time and build the culture and staff skills to do it. I understand the desire to establish a new group and we are grateful for the suggestion. However, I said I'll always be straight with people, we will not be taking it on. The work that is needed now is to ensure that a culture of engagement is built into everything we do. In many organisations in the city, we have incredible examples of co-production and citizen engagement, and we want to make sure that we learn from them. We have much to learn from others in the city. We know that there are also people who we do not reach and listen to enough, and we want to make sure that we reach them, including through further developing the committee system. It's a start, it's not the end. It's also worth mentioning the very challenging financial position that the council is in and the impact this has had on constraining the ability to invest in people, development and capability. However, we need to change that. Engagement is a real priority. I welcome support and challenge from all residents across Sheffield. It is right that people are here today to ask questions. I am going to encourage us as a council to have the challenging conversations that mean we ensure that all residents have input into the decisions that affect them across all council services. Doing that will be a systemic process which we cannot shortcut by endorsing any one group or one way of doing things. I look forward to receiving feedback, ideas and proposals from informed citizens as our work progresses. Thank you. Can I get a brief right to reply to that? I'm going to make progress because Very we've, got briefly. A lot, we've got a lot of questions. That I think it would be right. But we can't, well, just very briefly, we can can't wait till 2025. We need to do it now. We've got the Street Tree Partnership. We can do something similar and we can help. We want to help. We can bring more money in. We can help you make the decisions. If you, do, if you choose not to accept it, well, we'll see where it goes. As I said, Mr Johnson, we look forward to receiving feedback, ideas, proposals and working with people. Thank you. Uh, the next person to ask questions is uh, Justin Buxton. Hi, thank you. Um, three questions um, with uh, some questions underneath those. Um, please, could the um, council confirm or deny whether they contravened its own data manage management policy in not retaining documents requested by the, the documents requested by the Bevan Britain uh, investigation. B, those requested by the Forestry Commission's investigation. And furthermore, C, a huge amount of emails that were deleted by a senior officer um, from their account on leaving the council. So they weren't available for Sir Mark Lowcock to review. Question two. Please could the council confirm or deny that both assertions that the ser that service standard 6.38 of the streets head contract to replace 17 and a half thousand trees, healthy or not, could not be could not be renegotiated, and separately, that any any renegotiation would cost huge amounts of money to the citizens of Sheffield and the council. Were these both dishonest statements? B. For the record, when was Service Standard 6.38 renegotiated? and revised to remove the contractual obligation for the replacement of 17 and a half thousand trees, whether healthy or not, from the streets ahead contract, and did this incur any financial cost to the council? C, further to the removal of 17 and a half thousand obligation in the contract, 
has financial readjustment been made in the favour of the council? Question three. Please could the council confirm or deny the pursuance of the streets, hedge, streets tree felling programme in Sheffield, the associ associated shameful legal actions, the considerable financial cost incurred by the council, and the resultant reputational damage suffered was actually a policy decision and not necessary to satisfy any statutory duties as previously asserted in court and to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. So to answer your first question, um, or parts of your, your the different parts of your first question. The inquiry report makes clear that while the council faced some challenges in producing all the documentation asked for quickly, it did find and supply everything that the inquiry needed. This is covered in Annex B of the inquiry's report. Supplying this information included going back through hard copy and archived files and reconstructing inboxes. The council did not breach policy or practice in document retention. However, the council accepts that there were failures in record retrieval and record keeping. The Bevan Britain investigation was an independent evaluation of how the council has applied the exemption for legal professional privilege in its freedom of information and environmental information regulation responses. Bevan Britain sampled 17 requests, but received information relating to only six requests. Information regarding the other 11 requests was held but not provided at the time. This was due to staff working remotely during the height of the pandemic and being unfamiliar with the files when collating the information for the investigation. All 11 files have since been offered to the information commissioner should he wish to review our decision making. The findings of the Forestry Commission in July 2018 were in relation to its record keeping and access to information. The Forestry Commission was concerned that they had to submit requests under the Environmental Information Regulations Act 2004 for information for their investigation to the council. The council regrets that a statutory body should have had to use a right to know piece of legislation to obtain information that it was legally entitled to. We only keep inboxes, email inboxes for 30 days after a member of staff has left unless there are reasons to keep it longer. Where an inbox was not retained, the council's IT department was able to retrieve and reconstruct the inbox. We are not aware of any officer intentionally destroying emails before they left the organization. Emails are only a channel of communication between officers, partners, and the general public. Records of decisions or, or important business activity are downloaded or saved to the shared network. To answer your second question. Excuse me, could I just respond to that? No, um, make progress because I've, we've got- Oh quite, yes, but uh, the last statement saying that um, you're not aware of um, staff deleting um, emails from, from inboxes or outboxes. Um, that's incorrect and I, I can pass on the email from um, from the council that confirmed that that was actually done. Okay, I would, if there is information that is incorrect in the answer I've given, I would be grateful if you could provide me with some answers on that. Thank you very much. And I'll copy in the ICO, of course. Thank you. In response to the second question, um, in the report that we have before us today, you have seen the Council's draft apology to the residents of Sheffield and beyond. That apology says that we agree that the Council misinterpreted data leading to wrongly including in the contract the aim to replace 50% of Sheffield street trees, and we apologise for developing and adopting a flawed plan and including that aim. As the inquiry notes, the Council had negotiating power and could have looked to vary the contract from the start to start to resolve the dispute. Sorry. The apology acknowledges that instead, the council chose to escalate. As the inquiry concluded, this was part of a failure of strategic leadership for which we are very sorry. The change to the contract, which included amendments to performance requirement 6.38, was finalized and entered into on the 1st of November, 2022. The purpose of the change was to align to the principles of the Street Tree Partnership Strategy to ensure cooperation with that strategy, and in so doing, 
achieve the aim of retaining street trees where possible by using a flexible combination of arbicultural or highway engineering solutions, enhanced monitoring and maintenance of street trees, appropriate species selection, and decisions on the removal and replacement of street trees made on a case-by-case -case basis. The only cost that the council has incurred as a result of this change are associated with its own internal resourcing, such as staff involved in the contract management and legal support. The variation of the contract last year to embed the street tree partnership approach incorporated a number of changes to the performance requirements. Full details of those changes can be found on our Democratic Services website under the decision details for the street tree service outcomes amends, for which I will make sure that you are sent a direct link. The changes require Amy to align their contract outputs with the outcomes of the strategy, but they weren't considered a material change to the performance requirements of the contractor. As a result, there were no financial readjustments in favour of or against the council. To answer your third question. The council has a statutory duty to maintain the highway, and this was covered comprehensively in the judicial review proceedings and can encompass replacing street trees. The Streets Ahead contract included the provision of the street tree replacement program. Amy worked with the council to fulfill those contractual obligations. It would not be accurate to describe the street tree replacement program as either wholly policy or wholly necessary to carry out those statutory duties. But in the apology that we have before us today, we acknowledge that when the changes, when the consequences of a flawed plan began to become clear, the council chose to escalate rather than to pause, negotiate and change. Since the dispute, we've made many changes, including the tree replace, replacement program of the Streets Ahead contract. These help prevent issues arising again. There's a lot of information there and with all of the written answers, we will make sure that you get sent the copies so that you can rightly scrutinize them. And if there are things that you want to come back on, then you can do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll definitely be coming back on a number of questions, especially the, uh, uh, your answer to question three, um, which is uh, rather uh, inconclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Richard Ward. And I believe, uh, is it Mr. Pickles? Yes. yes so you're, uh, perhaps you could just introduce yourself and explain you're delivering the statement. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Martin Pickles from the uh, Stag Elected Committee. Uh, the question I have uh, has been written by Richard Ward on behalf of the Stag Elected Committee. <clears throat> the conclusions and recommendations of the Lowcock report, published on the 6th of March, had seismic implications for the way that politics is conducted in the city of Sheffield. The inquiry's report highlighted profound problems in the governance arrangements of the City Council and in the chosen approach to engagement with the public. That approach was characterised by a confrontational and malicious approach to challenge a clear and consistent political choice. The Lowcock report vindicated the sacrifices of many Sheffielders who chose to oppose a deeply flawed strategy for the management of the city's street trees. Beyond the trees, it is important to be able to see the heartwood of problems in the way that the city's governance failed citizens. There were clear systemic problems and failures in council governance, culture and strategic leadership. There is therefore an undoubtedly broad benefit to be gained from getting the response to the inquiry right. It is vital that any action plan arising from consideration of the Lowcock conclusions and recommendations and their acceptance in full demonstrates insight on the democratic deficit which must be accountably addressed by city politicians. There must be broad oversight of such arrangements through stakeholder engagement. Effective monitoring of change processes and outcomes is essential. STAG remains willing to participate in such monitoring and to bring constructive challenges to bear when and as required. Some city councillors have had the temerity to remain in post despite their deep complicity in bringing the city into disrepute. Their actions, including their boycott of the 10th May Council ECM, sit badly with their victims and with any objective assessment of the pathway to reconciliation. 
councillors of all parties need to consider the roles played by past cabinet members and the resolutions agreed at the 10th of May ECM. The broad thrust of the paper before the Strategy and Resources Policy Committee provides sufficient constructive direction and impetus to begin the journey towards a meaningful and enduring reconciliation. There are matters of detail which, which must, though, be amplified. We would like to re-emphasise our strong belief that the Council has a powerful moral obligation to assist individuals impacted by convictions and cautions applied during the dispute as a direct consequence of protest actions against the Council's demonstrably unethical, inappropriate, intimidatory, disproportionate and often aggressively premised actions. Consequently, it remains our view that it is morally unacceptable for there to have been no consequences for senior offices and cabinet members whose at best questionable actions or inactions are now well documented. Their abuse of power and failure of strategic leadership brought the council's reputation into significant disrepute and willfully sought to blight the lives of protesters. The victims of that corporate malice should not be abandoned. It is important to consider whether, especially given the change of many leadership roles in the Council, the current post holders fully understand why things went so badly wrong during the street tree dispute. Stag remains concerned, however, that if the Council does not understand how these mistakes were made, it will be hard to avoid repeating them in future. This is particularly important in view of the considerable amounts of time and money committed by not only SCC, but also AMI and South Yorkshire Police in pursuit of propping up a flawed plan. Whether monies come to the council directly or from central government, ultimately it comes from the wallets of ordinary people and we require you all to spend this wisely. An apology is undoubtedly owed, but not explicitly mentioned in the paper to the Sheffield public for the money wasted by the Council and the squandered opportunity costs arising from dogged and blinkered pursuit of its flawed plans. The paper acknowledges the inherent complexities of delivering apologies of the right kind to the many who deserve to have harms to them acknowledged. Those harms take many forms, including physical, emotional and, fin and financial. The formulation of meaningful apologies will require great care to ensure that the Council can demonstrate that it knows in each case what it is apologising for. In relation to the above point, a significant outstanding issue which should be brought within the scope of the response paper is the mishandling of complaints against the Council during the dispute. Inaction on those complaints is indefensible. Locock was clear that the inquiry should not be used as an excuse to set aside due process. Stagg strongly supports the view that mishandled historical complaints should be revisited in, revisited in a proper, rigorous and accountable fashion in the light of now available evidence. This will allow the Council to show it is serious about applying its currently agreed complaints procedures and will allow more of those harmed be properly heard. It is easy to talk of lessons learnt. Organisational learning and change on the scale necessitated by a meaningful inquiry response will be a great accomplishment. Credible understanding and demonstrable learning will not fall into place overnight. The corporate insight demonstrated in learning from the past and moving ahead must ensure a council more open to public engagement accountable and fitter for purpose in the eyes of the wider public. In considering this paper, is the committee satisfied that the recommendations before it can achieve that end? Thank you, Mr Pickles, for delivering that statement and asking that question. And thank you uh, to Mr Ward for um, submitting that. I'm very grateful for the ongoing support and challenge that STAG offers the Council, as I know that other members of this committee are too. 
you've spoken very clearly today about your hopes and, and aspirations for the success of the actions within the report before us today. I do believe that following this committee's consideration, these actions will mean that we can continue to build on the recovery from the dispute. I am under no illusions of the scale of the task at hand or the depth of the change that is required. But I am confident that the report before us gives us the framework to achieve the goals that you set out in the statement and that we seek to achieve in the report. I and this committee and others throughout this council with the people of Sheffield will work to ensure that happens. Rightly, you and others will be able to hold us to account for that. Set out in the report today is a monitoring and accountability uh, arrangements that are associated with those recommendations. They will be there so that people can hold us to account and you'll be able to come back and talk to us if we are not fulfilling them. We do understand the task at hand and the job today is to get them away. Thank you. Next set of questions are, have been submitted by Ruth Hubbard, but I believe are being delivered today by Helen McEwall. Thanks, Helen. Sorry, Helen. Yes, I'm Helen McElroy, and I'm speaking on behalf of Ruth Hubbard, whose questions these are. My questions largely focus on pages 34 to 40 of the report on wider council issues. One, there is a big gap in the report presented today in respect of the cultural change needed within the political groups in the council. What have each of the political groups in the council identified as the problematic aspects of their own party group political cultures and how are they addressing these? My question is directed at all party groups. Obviously, this is a particularly important question for Sheffield Labour, given their dominance in the council and the low COP findings. And despite the recent changes in personnel which they might wish to cite, these were not brought about by them taking responsibility and acting accordingly, and political cultures go beyond individuals involved. This is also a particularly pertinent question for Sheffield Labour, as at least one of their number has made it repeatedly clear in the press that they do not accept LOCOC, and members of the public wishing to raise, the, to raise LOCOC as a local area committee were shut down by a local Labour councillors. They have just fought a local election where their focus has been entirely on gaining overall control, which would always have involved a mandate from an extreme minority of voters, even if it had been achieved, and on not discussing LOCOC. One of their party grandees, David Blunkett, has also in intervened unhelpfully several times. All this does not indicate a political culture that is changing, nor one that has even yet understood the problems. The question, however, is also addressed to the other main political groupings in the Council, as they have, have also been caught up in and part of the long-term political culture of our Council. I note that even with no overall control, they failed to show the will and to secure basic accountability for long-term wrongdoing. They seem to largely accept a status quo political culture that focuses on narrow party interests at all times, or that might be happy to accept the crumbs from the Labour table. So my question again, what have each of the main political party groups in the council recognised from LOCOC and identified as the problematic aspects of their own party group political cultures and how are they addressing these? Question two. Five years ago next week, I had the pleasure and privilege of announcing at a press conference the end of a strong leader governance in Sheffield through what would become the largest citizen-led action of its kind ever mounted. I'm pleased paragraph 85 of the report at Council today acknowledges that so far there has been a focus on what it calls the logistical and practical steps to change its governance system. It says this was done by necessity, but in my view this approach was always misguided and fundamentally flawed, as well as offensive to the reasons why governance was changed, which was entirely down to citizens organising and legally requiring change. It is a good example of how, when it comes to it, the Council puts its own needs first within a narrow and insular framework of reference. So whilst technical change has been delivered, meaningful change in demonstrating democratic value for citizens has been excluded and remains largely unaddressed. 
The recent governance review took the same narrow approach, and so it failed to do what it said it was going to do, as agreed by full council. It's also failed to use any of its own toolkit to develop the review, failed to engage citizens and stakeholders in carrying out the review, and fundamentally failed to establish any sort of outcomes, benchmarks, or performance measures by which it could make any claim to progress. My major concern about the report today is that on the wider governance priority confirmed by LOCOC, there is little evidence of progress, despite activity. In the report today, it appears yet more activity continues to be a substitute for clear and meaningful purpose, outcomes, and democratic value. Layer upon layer of complexity to existing activity is being added by new bodies being established, for example, with yet more mere activity to undertake and about which citizens have little information that has also been presented in some other recent reports that have been available late and beyond deadlines. The only related performance measure we currently have is a commitment to reduce the backlog of FOI requests, which is simply a basically statutory duty anyway. I like values and think they're important, but it is, it is way past time to move beyond these. Merely repeating again and again, fine words, is simply reinforcing the huge gaps between the rhetoric and the realities of council governance. Operationalization at a constitutional level is absent. This begins to look like a failure of leadership or a continuing resistance to change or just an inability to see the wood for the trees, although I'm sure this is not the impression that the council would want to give. When and how will clear, specific and meaningful outcomes for governance change be developed, including those that will embrace and deliver democratic value for citizens that have been ignored for so long, and not just the continuance of an approach that serves the narrow and insular needs of the council itself? And when will these begin to be operationalized as a starting point and where appropriate in the consultation? I'm sorry, I'll read last sentence again. When will these begin to be operationalized as a starting point and where appropriate in the Constitution? Question three. At paragraph 96, the report to Council states it has provided the LOCOC report to its auditors and spoken to them about calls for a public interest report specifically. A. Has the Council drawn the auditors' attention to any items relating to the possible misuse of public funds over the years of the street tree crisis? and similar items emerging since the publication of LOCOC, e.g. in respect of money spent seeking to pressure the police to take more extreme action against protesters. B. How did the Council represent public calls for a public interest report to its auditors? I am part of one group who has publicly stated the potential need for a public interest report. We have not been asked for any more information as to our reasoning, so what has the Council told its auditors about the public interest here? C. The public have a statutory right to inspect council accounts and raise challenges with the auditors direct. What is the timeline for the council to publish as required the opportunity for members of the public to inspect the latest council accounts so that there can be any direct follow through with the auditors? Question four. In recent weeks and months, a group of citizens and stakeholders have informally been discussing setting up a citizen-led uh, scrutiny body for the Council, given the shortcomings in current Council approaches and failure to integrate and engage citizens in decision-making and, uh, and governance. We have been talking under the, under the name Sheffield Oversight and Scrutiny, SOS, to reflect the urgency and seriously, seriousness of the issues. I also understand there are others who are discussing the need for similar kinds of activities. What encouragement and support would the Council like to offer in respect of developing this important work? Thank you very much. <laughs> um, right, so thank you. In answer to your first question, um, I can obviously only speak for the group that I lead but I'm sure that my cross-party colleagues will be glad to respond to your question in their remarks later in the meeting. As the new leader of the council and of Sheffield Labour Group, let me be clear that I fully accept all of Sir Mark's conclusions and recommendations, as does my party and the party I, and the group that I lead. On March the 8th, 
Sheffield Labour issued a statement to wholeheartedly apologise for the failures and mistakes made by our previous <coughs> administration. I repeat that apology today. There have been important and avoidable mistakes, mistakes that I and my colleagues are determined to put right. The work to rebuild trust will take time. It will require a spirit of partnership, consensus and openness, and that is a shared responsibility of all members. Today's report is an important step on that long journey. As the leader of the council, I expect all elected members in my party and others and all officers to understand the seriousness of what happened during this dispute and commit to work together to ensure that a dispute of this magnitude can never happen again. To answer your second question, the council is clear that although we have made progress in establishing our new governance arrangements, there still exists a significant road to travel to meet our aspirations of being a genuinely open and transparent organisation one that puts citizen voice and participation at the heart of what it does and how it does it. The evidence is clear that involving people in shaping the solutions to issues that affect their lives results in better and more equitable decisions being made. However, although engagement in the formal decision-making process is important, to be truly meaningful, involvement and participation must come at a er much earlier stage of policy development and design. The Council's Governance Committee, in their report to full Council, identified public engagement as one of the areas that they want to focus on over the year ahead. As the question has identified, the engagement toolkit adopted at the inception of the committee system is not yet embedded across the committees in the way that we would like it to be. There have been examples of good and developing practice in the organisation over the last 12 months, including but not limited to activity in local area committees. However, it's not yet consistent or embedded. To address this, both through the work of the Governance Committee and the Council's Future Sheffield Transformation Programme, we will seek to make engagement, involvement and participation more central to our work. The Council's corporate plan will set clear outcomes and ambitions for the authorities' work, against which we and the public will be able to hold ourselves accountable for delivery. To turn to your third question, and part A and B first. As the report today before us sets out, we have spoken to our auditors. This was in the context of the publication of the inquiry and calls by yourself and others for a public interest report. The consideration of whether there needs to be a public interest report is a matter for the auditor, but if they want to understand the views of those who have suggested it, we will provide them with contact details. The auditors have a statutory right of inspection and the council fully engages with that process. We have ensured they have the inquiry's report and that they can take up any line of inquiry on spending that they think appropriate. On part C of the question, the council published its unaudited accounts for the 2022-23 financial year on the 31st of May, 2023. The period for local ele electors to exercise any rights ends on the 12th of July, 2023. So in about three weeks. And then to answer your fourth question. As I acknowledged when addressing Mr. Johnson's question, we welcome support and challenge from all residents across Sheffield. I'm going to encourage us as a council to have the challenging conversations that mean that we ensure all residents get the input into the decisions that affect them across all council services. Doing that will be a systemic process to build in that culture of engagement throughout the organisation will be systemic. We can't cut that short by endorsing any one group. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming today and for your questions. We have... Um, Just, just one, one second. Um, we've, we've got a couple of minutes before the hour, and then I am going to have to put that hard deadline in force because we've given a lot of time for public questions today. Public questions are submitted in advance, and that means that we're able to prepare detailed answers 
and I have received a note that's been passed to me today, which I believe is from yourself. Um, and so what I will suggest is that we have a conversation, because um, do you want to just very briefly explain the note so that we're not, we can bring others into this conversation? Perhaps you could just introduce yourself. My name is Benoit Compin, and I've uh, asked a question last time, which was unanswered, so I'm coming here to get an answer today. Okay. So the, it, am I okay to read out the note you've given me today? Yes, I just want to know when we are going to meet to initiate uh, a, a resolution of the case I'm uh, being involved with the council. Okay. Um, we've not met before. Okay. I will be glad to have that conversation with you. I don't know what previous conversations have taken place, but if I can, if you can leave your details with colleagues um, at this meeting, I will be glad to follow up. We'll have a chat later on if you wish. Thank you very much. But I will leave this council room when I've got an appointment. Okay. Just so you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, what I might suggest, because it's very warm in here, is that we just adjourn the meeting for a couple of minutes. If anyone wants to get any water, um, then they can do. But I will just pause there for a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. Water. Um, so we are now going to move on to the, the report before us, um, learning from the past and moving ahead, the response to the Sheffield Street Tree Inquiry. Uh, and this is page nine of the agenda pack. The presenting officers will be Kate Josephs, Lucy Hayes and Richard Eyre. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, I'm going to, I've got a fair few remarks um, in here, but I just want to be thorough in going through what's in the report. So please bear with me. The report responds, as we know, to the Sheffield Street Tree Inquiry by Sir Mark Lowcock. There are 36 actions in this report, all of which directly address the recommendations and lessons set out by the inquiry report. Each action has a deadline and a named owner. It also has um, a relevant officer level governance board and a committee so that progress can be monitored by us and by the public, very importantly. The actions align with the strategic framework for 2023-24 that we discussed at the last meeting of this committee, as well as the six month review of governance and the city goals development, really importantly. Um, this all aims to ensure that the council addresses the issues in a way which has an impact across the whole organization. Um, Development has been supported by feedback from the 10th of May Extraordinary General Meeting, by offices from across the council, by Amy um, partners, by representations from the public and representative groups, and by feedback from an implementation working group. And I would just like to express my thanks um, to all of those um, who have spent the time over the last um, uh, number of weeks talking to myself and to offices, including individuals who were affected and uh, and, and recognising the ongoing effects of some of the harm that they experienced. Those people have been incredibly generous with their ideas, with their constructive challenge, and we have tried our very best to reflect um, all of the ideas and challenges that were brought to us um, ahead of the publication and development of the report. The report structured um, in a way uh, that firstly sets out the context of the inquiry and what's happened since, and the body of the report sets out those actions against the three categories of recommendations uh, that Sir Mark put forward. Firstly, reconciliation, secondly, streets ahead, and thirdly, wider council issues. Each section does set out what has been done to date, recognising that uh, we have been working hard. It sets out clear, shorter, and longer term actions, and there are also a set of annexes, uh, which include an action summary table, and we hope that will allow for really clear accountability and transparency that enables engagement from all uh, members of the public and partners who wish to uh, wish to engage. There are a huge diversity of views um, and it hasn't been possible to reconcile them all, but we have addressed every single point that has been raised with us in the development of this paper in the in the document. Um, where views have diverged, we have uh, the inquiry report is the definitive guide on what should be done. So, to the overall actions and the budget um, set out, um, I want to just um, set out some overarching points. Um, the cost of the inquiry, its setup and recommendations to date, has been £839,000. This includes the cost of reimbursing the small number of people who have made payments to the Council against financial court orders. 
Um, the report recommends allocating up to a further £200,000 from reserves to cover the costs of the actions to respond to the inquiry's recommendations. We've earmarked around £50,000 for each set of actions and remaining budget is to cover costs associated with the inquiry, such as final invoices and archiving. Some of the actions within this report are, though, investigative, and the course of action they recommend may have additional financial implications. So where this is the case, further advice will come to this committee. Claire Taylor, the new Chief Operating Officer, will ensure that this committee receives progress updates in the winter and next summer against all of those recommendations. So I'm now going to just speak through the three areas of recommendations and summarise the, um, the actions in the report. Firstly, reconciliation. The inquiry's first set of four recommendations address action to support reconciliation. Subject to this committee's approval, the Council will publish online tomorrow at 9am and distribute widely the full apology for everything we got wrong in the design of the tree replacement programme and handling of the dispute. Annex B to the paper sets out the recommended full apology to be signed by the leader of the Council and myself. The inquiry report makes clear that there are specific groups of people and organisations who are owed apologies, and I recommend that the monitoring officer or I write to each of these and apologise. As acknowledged by this committee on the 15th of March, there are some individuals who will be owed apologies, and the report recommends setting up a dedicated inbox so that these people can contact the council and these apologies can be made. During the dispute, people and the public often had to wait too long for a response from the council, and for this reason, we have set a very clear deadline for apologies in the paper. Amy issued their apology on the 9th of May, fulfilling recommendation two, and we've also annexed to the report the apology from STAG. Um, which I thank them for. We dropped outstanding financial claims against protesters in March and went further, reimbursing people who have made payments during the month of April. We know that some of the small number of people who were found to have breached the injunction face ongoing issues related to having this on their record, and we will now, con con subject to the committee's agreement, contact these people directly and work with them to do everything possible to mitigate any ongoing impact. In the development of this work, some campaigners have asked whether the council will be paying compensation. As the report sets out, the inquiry report does not establish a legal basis for any claim for damages. We've assessed the question of a compensation scheme without a legal basis and judged that it would be complex, likely to create further disquiet and costly. It could also risk judicial review. Having investigated the question in depth, we do not recommend a compensation scheme. Finally, in this section, the report asked this committee to agree the action to install a plaque um, at the entrance to the town hall in line with the motion from the EGM on the 10th of May. The second area of recommendations relate to Streets Ahead and the Street Tree Partnership um, and support the ongoing success of the Sheffield Street Tree Partnership and managing that Streets Ahead contract. Firstly, this section sets out a firm commitment, which has been negotiated with Amy, to have designs in place for all the roads outstanding from the dispute period by March next year and all works completed in the financial year 2024-25. This is a significant action and this committee should ask the Waste and Street Scene Committee to hold the Council and Amy to this timeline. This section goes on to set out short-term actions to support the Street Tree Partnership to go from strength to strength, including... Council and Amy attendance at the partnership, recruitment to increase capacity to support it, and the role for the partnership in ensuring that outstanding roads are addressed appropriately. In the longer term, the council will support the partnership to develop further, and the report sets out investigative work to support this. This section goes on to address the ongoing management of the Streets Ahead contract. In the short term, this focuses on creating new roles and capacity within the council, complemented by refreshed governance and business cases. It also includes working with Amy to ensure sufficient tree inspector capacity. We need to make sure we have the skills to manage the contract over time and respond to newer challenges and take advantage of new opportunities. In the longer term, we will take forward investigative work around the capacity and skills we need and work across partners and central government to manage the end of so many pub PFIs, public finance, um, uh, well, I thought PFI means it, PFIs in a short period. The report also commits us to preparing for the legacy of the contract seven years um, uh, prior to its ending. Finally, to wider council issues. The inquiry report found issues in the wider council processes, which, with other reports, including the Race Equality Commission and the Local Government Association Peer Challenge Review, um, also um, reinforced and found. 
Aligned against our value that openness and honesty are important to us, we will commission case studies to help us learn, design options to embed a climate of engagement, and work with the ICO to improve our FOI processes, embedding ways of working which embed good information management and communication. We'll also li liaise with the local government ombudsman to seek from them any views on our approach to addressing the issues which the inquiry highlights. To support our value that together we get things done, we will prioritise work on the cultural aspects of governance to realise the benefits of the committee system of governance and embed actions to support engagement. This um, means learning from and embedding some of the incredible best practice we see, as the leader has said, around co-production and community engagement all over our city, some in some teams in the council, um, but also across our partners. We will also work with others to look at options for managing large-scale contracts um, and to share learning with those with similar responsibilities, including in other local authorities. And we've recently co-produced our values with staff. So supporting our value that people are at the heart of what we do, we will develop a senior manager pledge and an employee engagement strategy. And we'll also take to Audit and Standards Committee a report on the standards regime and council code of conduct. To sum up then, the inquiry was the definitive independent investigation into the dispute. While we are recommending work with the ICO and liaison with the LGO and our auditors, we do not recommend commissioning further investigations. Taken together, this set of actions represents a comprehensive and we believe effective set of actions that we can take to ensure we never make the same mistakes again. They build on the changes to date and should help us to continue to demonstrate that we can move forwards together positively. I recommend that the committee agree these actions and the budget associated, and I'm joined here, um, as you said, by Richard Eyre, Director of Street Scene and Regulation Services, and Lucy Hayes, who have supported us all to author this report. Together, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for presenting this important report. Um, before I invite questions and, and comments from members of the committee, I will make a short statement as leader of the council, which will be followed by a statement from the leader of the Liberal Democrats group and by a statement from the Green Party group. The dispute that is definitively detailed in Sir Mark Locock's report was a dark episode in Sheffield. Much has already changed in the council in the five years since 2018 when a new approach was taken, but there is still much to do to learn the lessons of that period. The report before us today demonstrates that. The 36 actions in the report directly address the recommendations and lessons set out by the inquiry report. <coughs> they, as we've heard, are accompanied by a plan so that we can monitor progress to meet them and so that the public can hold us accountable for meeting them. One of the recommendations that Sir Mark made was for the council to issue a comprehensive and fulsome apology for the things that we got wrong during the dispute. As we've heard, a draft apology is included in the report and as the Chief Executive has explained, subject to the agreement of this committee, it will be published tomorrow and made permanently available on the Council's website. I want to take this opportunity to state clearly and unreservedly that we are sorry for the actions that we took during the Street Trees dispute. The Council's behaviours led to significant harms being caused and they meant that people lost trust and faith in us. We hope that this apology and our actions will begin the process of restoring trust and faith. But we know that apologies without action are meaningless. Words matter, but words alone are not enough. It is only by changing the way that we work that lasting and sustained change will occur. Change that will mean a dispute of this magnitude with our residents can never happen again. To achieve that change, we will and are placing people at the heart of what we do. The council that we want to be is one that looks outwards, invites scrutiny and works in partnership with the people of Sheffield. A council that listens, consults and is open to feedback ideas and suggestions. A council that creates a culture where engagement is built into everything we do. I know that the actions of the past mean that some people may be sceptical that our words today will change things in the future. I understand that entirely. It is a significant task to rebuild trust to change the culture of this organisation and to move forward together. That work is already underway. As the new leader, I can assure you that my colleagues and I, both members and officers, are committed to making those changes and to seeing them through. We will work with the residents of Sheffield to continue our work to be the best we can be. 
we will listen and we will learn, we will try and maybe we will fail sometimes. Failing and making mistakes is part of life, but refusing to listen and learn is a mistake that we can never repeat. Councillor Mohammed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the street tree issue is quite close to me in the sense that a lot of the people that spoke today, I know well, stood alongside them, supported their actions and was totally dismayed by the reactions that used to come out of this town hall from both officers and senior councillors at the time. And I think the challenge before this council now is words are easy, statements are easy to make. I think what people out there will judge us on in a year's time or five years time is how, how substantially has the culture both within the office of the call, but also amongst the politicians, in particular the Labour group, if I'm going to be honest here, have they changed? And whether that requires a change of personnel or not, it's something I, you know, I see some nods from the members of the public, feel that some of those people that were involved and were around the table from 2015 onwards, whether they were council at the time or not, were involved in politics locally here and need to consider whether they are part of that future or not. We made that point at the general meeting. I make it here now, but ultimately they have to make that choice. Um, the city can't be held back for that. The city has many other challenges it faces that it needs to deal with. For me, it's also about how we take the city forward and how we engage and work for the whole city, because this ended up dividing the city. It very much became a us and them issue. If you look at some of the statements and things that were said about, you know, people in the west of the city that I represent only cared about the trees because it was about the house price, etc. Mm -hmm. We can never go back to that sort of situation ever again. We've got to be a council that actually is there for the whole city. And for me. Somebody asked the question about, well, what, what do we take as political parties? Clearly, the Labour Party will take some long looks at themselves. But one of the things that I think we as a council have to do is the centre here has to let go more. So the people sat around these tables here have to do less. And we have to trust people out there more, including our own colleagues that are elected. There's 84 of us. And actually, the communities out there, because that's why I was hearing from people saying so less power in this place more power outside let people make local choices that affect them directly let them have more of a say i think is a key takeaway for me from this because we are centralized too much i know we're a different world now with committee system and the cabinet model and etc but there's key things we still take away that we've got to empower local communities to be able to decide what's best for them, not just those sat in this town hall, the eight to 10 of us. Um, the other thing for me clearly will be that we need to have some review points. I mean, 200,000 pounds have been allocated. I think the leader made a, I think, a commitment to say that if that's not sufficient, that you take some advice from that. Let's see what happens there. And I think we should come back in a year's time and let the people of Sheffield, and particularly the tree campaigners, tell us whether we've actually started that journey of change, because you know we can sign up to all the recommendations today, and I'm sure there could be more. Um, but ultimately, proof of the pudding will be the actual actions. Do people out there feel that we've now got a listening council, or are we going back to our old ways again? And that will be really interesting if one of the groups takes control, whether it's the Labour group or ourselves, and we have majority control, how we then behave. And I'll be, I'm being honest with that. That is an issue that either me or Tom or whoever sits in Tom's place and whoever sits in my place will have to answer is in decades to come. Have we really changed because of this? Or did we do this because we were in a difficult situation with the local report and no overall control? So we decided to work with each other. But as soon as we got the first chance to uh, take power, we, we did it. And if that's what happens, then I don't think we've ever learned anything from Lowcock or and we'll end up making the same mistakes, be it on a different issue. Thank you, Councillor Mohammed. 
Um, I'll now turn to Councillor Johnson. Well, thank you. Um, welcome the chance to say a, a few words because, of course, this has been an issue that's been um, affecting you know, everyone in Sheffield for a very long time now. And I was just reflecting on how long the Green Party has been in existence on this council. We had our first council election in 2004. Um, but the issues that we're dealing with today have been going on since not much later than that. So with over 15 years of this, it's been quite a big part of um, uh, the involvement of many people in the Green Party. Uh, so obviously I welcome the report of uh, Sir Mark Lowcock um, and the Council's formal response to it that we have today and the detailed and thorough apology that's given to the citizens of Sheffield for the way that the Council treated them over many years. I mentioned that 15 years then. Thinking back on it, when um, Councillor Alison Teal and I were negotiating the holding of an inquiry into the council's handling of the street trees um, issue. Um, it was only in our knowledge of the, the, the real harm and upset that was caused to uh, so many people in the city from the, the loss of these magnificent trees. Um, and in many cases, these, these were you know, the very best physical things on the streets, in the streets where they lived. And residents expressed this. They expressed this, this hurt to them as the felling had started. Um, they expressed it eloquently and in detail, at really quite an early stage of the tree felling campaign. And Sir Mark Lowcock agrees that those expressions of citizens should have been heeded. Uh, we know now there were many voices that should have been heeded at that time. So in 2021, um, when we were setting up the street tree inquiry, that the context of this was that the council had already changed dramatically at that point. And it was immediately after the governance referendum in 2021, um, where the people of Sheffield resoundingly voted for a change in the way the council was run. Also in May 2021, the ruling group had lost its overall majority control of the council. Uh, and we were in a new situation where um, the parties had to work together. The Lowcott report that's resulted has exposed the truths that are uncomfortable to a lot of people. Um, but they're also absolutely the vital issues um, that demonstrated how the council got so many things so wrong for so long. And in the two years, even since then, up to now, um, and certainly compared uh, with where we were 15 years ago, the council's changed incomparably. Uh, recently, we've had a near total change of senior leadership of the council, both at political level and at officer level. And more to the point, this has triggered and is triggering a very welcome change in culture. And that's important for all of us in the way that you know, we behave in this council now. And on reflection, that's not to say that things are perfect. Um, it's not to say that things are even acceptable in every case at the moment. There's a lot more to do. Um, as we've seen in this report. Um, however, the point is that the progress that leads up to today's apology um, has, has reset the trajectory of the council's future. And that's something that uh, the residents of Sheffield who became involved in campaigns over many years should be able to take credit for. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I'll now open up the um, time that we have for other questions and comments from other members of the committee. I see Councillor Potter. Thanks, um, thanks Tom. Um, I have, I've got three, three points. I don't know if you want to want to talk one at a time. Um, so the first one is obviously as, as Western Street scene, we, we accept the recommendations here. I, I do notice we're being asked to recruit additional people and employ them and have them work with a, with a tree partnership. Um, and I agree with that. I, I just also noticed we haven't been given a budget to do that. We're, we've been asked to find that from within Waste and Street Scene Resources, which is, a, is, a, is effectively a cut to the portfolio somewhere else that we will have to find. Um, I would ask that this committee to look at that again and say, actually, no, the work you do in the rest of the portfolio is important. We don't need to cut that in order to meet this recommendation. So that's just an ask. Um, that's my first point. Do you want to make the other two? So, um, second point is that, I mean, I noticed at the beginning um, of the report, um, I lost my page now, um, yes, uh, page 14 of the agenda, 
On the climate implications, and I'm, I'm going to expand on this slightly, it's not just about climate implications. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about um, expanding tree canopy and how marvellous that is. And I just want to be sure we're not overselling what we're doing here. This is not really a report about the trees, after all. It's a report about the council and how we operate and how, you know, how governance works. And there is some stuff about trees in there. And there are some plans going forward into how we don't make the mistakes again um, in the future and that we, we, we deal with the, the highway trees that we've got. But to say we're, you know, to talk about the benefits of expanding can canopy, I mean, and putting aside... Non-highway trees, which, which, which you know, we obviously we have a, a, a program for, for planting, um, is overriding it. It's it, you know, we, we are the, the, the contract standard is replacing one for one, and very often with smaller trees. And I, you know, I don't dispute that for good reasons. Sometimes they do, they should have had to be small trees, but that is a reduction in canopy. In some cases, we're putting in two for one, um, again because we, you know, um, following negotiations, um, and that's an improvement. But that, not, again, not necessarily an increase in canopy if, they, if there's more trees that are going in. And, then, and I don't think that's particularly common. Um, and we have, yeah, we have a, a program for individual and corporate sponsorship of, of highway trees. Unfortunately, uh, having agreed to do this, the, the price has come back and, and Sheffield is charging twice as much as any other um, city for, for the same thing. We're basically charging a sponsor or a, a resident £500 for a tree and, and any, any other city in the same programme is charging 250 Now, um, we've been told this, these are the actual costs and other cities are, are engaging in hidden subsidies. Um, but that means, if that's true, if that means we still need to find quite a lot of money if we want to extend the benefits of tree canopy to the parts of the city that don't have it, which is a kind of a stated aim and a stated and implied outcome that we're, we're putting in the beginning of the report. So, um, I, I, again, I would ask if, if, you, if you really want to deliver what is being offered on page 14, there is a, there is a significant uh, budget, budgetary implication to that as well. Okay, my final point, um, and this relates to the, the larger question of, uh, of culture change and, you know, have we learned the lessons, have we really heard? And this, uh, I suppose this, this is the most important point. Um, and I, I noticed um, um, Martin Pickles asked us, um, do the current um, post holders understand what was wrong with the culture? Um, do, do we understand what, what, you know, what, what needs to be changed, what has been changed, what still needs to be changed in order not to, for it not to happen again? Um, and clearly the committee system is part of that. But clearly the committee system, the, well, the real test would be under a majority control whether it would still operate as well as it does and you know and that's not to say how it operates now is is, is the final state and is is is, is bringing everything that it needs a, a lot of the decisions are still made behind closed doors effectively if not in in kind of legal practice so um i, I you know i think this is the largest question here and i don't think we've got in a report like this a sufficient answer to it and as to whether we've really taken it on each of us as you know the, 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 the importance the importance of having other voices in the room. I mean that's the one that that's, that, that that stands out to me. Even if even if you have a majority council and one party quite legitimately has the the power and the right to make the decision, to have other voices in the room who could then pay heed to or ignore um, is a, is a really important valuable thing. And that is what the that is what the committee system is meant to bring us. And I am struck, um, Councillor Hunt, that when the mayoral combined authority chose to change from its system of having thematic boards to having a cabinet model, and a, a, the, the phrase may be familiar to some of us in this room, um, that you nodded that through without objection. You didn't say, well, actually, we've learned a lesson in Sheffield that it's good to have other voices in the room, it's good to have more voices in the room, and just to have a cabinet member in their bunker making a decision is a, is a bad thing. And so I would... I would I'd be interested to hear from you how you think you've learned the lesson in here if you didn't object to that. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, we've got a number of people who've indicated. Uh, so far, I've got uh, Councillor Melbourne, Councillor Miskell, Councillor Naz. I'll take... I'll let the officers respond to your points, Joe, because there's quite a lot in there, and then we'll take some more comments and questions. 
Thank you. Um, just uh, first, I just wanted to respond to one specific point that Councillor Mohammed made, which is um, which he finished on, which was the point about us making sure that we're going to bring reports back to this place um, for conversation for, for review and. Um, within that, the, um, the idea that we're very clear that that would allow for scrutiny by the public. Um, to reiterate, um, on page uh, 10 of the report, we, we are clear that we think that the, an update um, on progress should come back to um, Strategy and Resources Committee in the winter, so six and 12 months effectively. Um, and we will certainly make sure that we work to ensure that that update is, um, is shared openly and is, is easily able to be scrutinised. Um, to Councillor Otten's questions, I'm going to hand over to uh, Richard to um, uh, cover the points on budget for Waste on Street scene and the Street Tree Partnership. Although I, I think I would make the point on um, canopy cover that, as you know, as you know, the Street Tree Partnership um, strategy has a really ambitious um, uh, commitment around canopy cover, and I think we shouldn't be we should feel optimistic that. There are numerous opportunities, um, including from other sources of funding, to um, to deliver many of those um, many of those objectives, um, which can only be supported by having a really strong street tree partnership that Richard will, will speak to. And then perhaps after you've done that, I'll come back to the ports trade front. Thanks, Kate. Um, in answer to Councillor Otten's question, so any new recruitment highlighted in, in its recommendations is currently from uh, vacancies to carry in the service, so there will be no additional pressure on the revenue budget. Um, sponsorship for um, trees, and particularly in areas of inequality across the city, as uh, the Chief Executive outlined, as part of the um, street tree strategy, we are pushing for more canop canopy cover across the city. Um, some ideas we're looking at around this are uh, corporate sponsorship, we are looking at funding streams as well, uh, external funding streams. Uh, so every avenue we can possibly explore to get funding into these areas, then we're, exp we're exploring that over the next few sort of weeks and months uh, in partnership. We're fairly confident we can start to look at corporate sponsorship. So the big companies in the city, as part of their social responsibility as well, start to build a bit of a, a fund to start looking at uh, canopy cover across the city. And as you know, um, canopy cover, um, particularly in areas of inequality, is, is a key strand of the street tree strategy. So that's, that's coming into effect over the next sort of weeks and months as well. Um, just to the, on the, the elements of the question around culture change that are, um, are not for officers, um, you've made the point that there are lots of officers now in the room who weren't here during this period. And do we and can we understand what really went wrong? I think um, it's important to be um, self-aware that we're not, going to understand that in, in all the detail that people who maybe were here can, but we can also bring some uh, ability to look at it with, uh, with a different, a fresh pair of eyes dispassionately and to listen to and hear from many people who were here at the time um, and triangulate those views. I think it is though important that we as a senior leadership team and across all the senior leaders in the organisation continue to ask ourselves the question are we are we still you know are we, are we remembering this as a as an important um, as an important uh, way marker in our journey as a council? Um, I think your point on other voices in the room is absolutely critical. It's something we know that we need to do more on. It was mentioned in the paper um, as a part of the priorities for the governance committee um, upcoming. But I would say I think there are already examples, including. Uh, in the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, which is one of the committees in, in the structure, the Adult Health, um, um, Adult, Health and, um, my Adult Health and Social Care Committee, um, forgetting all my acronyms today, um, has also done some really great work. And even things, um, we, this committee agreed a, um, uh, an all-age autism strategy, uh, I think in the last but one meeting or the last meeting. And for example, we've agreed that um, the co-chair of the board that holds that to account will be... Um, a citizen of Sheffield with lived experience of autism. So I think we're trying to do this wherever we can. There's, there will, there'll be always more we can do, but um, I'd really encourage members of the committee to keep challenging us as officers and yourselves as chairs of committees to ask where can we bring different voices in. Um, and apologies if I've done a disservice to other committees who are no doubt also doing some great stuff, bringing, uh, seeing Martin smiling at me because I know he's brought lots of external people in as well for EBS. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say on that one, Lee? I'll just touch directly on uh, Councillor Austin's final point, uh, which was addressed to me um, and the, the MCA cabinet model. Um, 
that MCA model will interact with this council and therefore it will interact with this committee system. There will be things that will need to be not agreed by that cabinet straight off. They will need to come back through this committee system in order to empower me as a representative of Chichester City Council to go to be at that table at the MCA to take a decision. That is a different approach that this council will need to take when it comes to our engagement with the Mayor of Combined Authority from the other three authorities. And the other point I would make is that everybody's able to look at the decision that I was there at the MCA board meeting and we, yes, agreed the new model. Those meet that meeting was live streamed. It was held in public. There were members of the public there. They were asking questions. Everything is published and people will be able to hold me to account. So that culture of openness, transparency and accountability, which we have done um, great things here to bring into the heart of our democratic decision making processes, those principles will hold um, in how I will be conducting myself at the MCA level. Okay, Councillor Belbin and then Councillor Miskell and then Councillor Naz, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to go back as well to the question of culture and uh, engagement because I think we probably all feel here that uh, democratic participation is a lot more than questioners having to turn up for half an hour at the beginning of a committee meeting or an hour in this case uh, and it's a lot more than just the H4 councillors uh, operating within the uh, committee system. I think uh, we are looking at that through the Governance Committee and I think we absolutely do need wider citizen engagement in creating that engagement strategy and, and the framework that we'll, be, uh, that we'll be using as the year progresses. We've got a starting point in the action plan that I hope we'll be passing here today, but we obviously want to be involving people who quite often feel excluded from decisions and we want to be reaching out to all the corners of Sheffield to get people involved in our decision making as well. And I think it's, we need to think about what we are involving them in. We're going probably beyond just asking a few questions or, or even scrutiny. But, you know, sometimes we'll be looking at just information sharing. Other times we'll want to consult widely. Other times we'll want those people to co-produce strategies, uh, uh, policies and so on with us. I think Kate didn't mention this, what I hope is going to be a successful piece of work around Sheffield City Goals at the moment where we've actually uh, gone out and involved, uh, coordinated by Voluntary Action Sheffield, who are leading a piece of work, do, uh, carrying out collaborative conversations with uh, people across the city. And that's all about developing where Sheffield is aiming to go as a city. So I think we do need to develop a whole range of tools that we can use in different situations, because this isn't going to be a one size fits all, here is our engagement model that we use everywhere will need to consider it and we absolutely need the input of, um, of people, of, of citizens inside that and we do need to commit to staff and resource to uh, embedding that culture which I know will take time and it will cost money but I think it will lead to better decision making and making us more likely to get things right first time round. Councillor Miskell. Um, Chair. Sir Mark Lowcock's report made clear the significant failings that occurred during the street tree dispute and we've all heard the very real hurt that was caused to many of those who gathered in the room today as well as a significant number of people outside the chamber. We all know that these were really dark days for Sheffield and of course the leader's right to make clear that we all have a responsibility to change in order to rebuild trust. Earlier in this meeting we heard from a citizen who noted that and the quote was, you work for us, in reference to both the work of councillors and the organisation as a whole. Because, of course, he is correct, and this has to be at the forefront of our minds today in how we move forward. And as Councillor Hunt stated in his early remarks, apologies without actions are meaningless, which is why we need to move forward with the recommendations of the report and agree all 36 actions in full, because it's the right thing to do, and it's a step that the public of this city would expect from us. The report contains a really detailed plan for moving us forward, setting out a course to systematically change the way that we do business and how we listen to the citizens of this city to ensure that the failings outlined in Sir Mark's report can never be repeated. It echoes the remarks made by um, Councillor Belbin earlier about how we can get more people involved in decision-making in our city. 
And as a council, of course, we've got to change as political groupings, we must change, and as individual elected members, we must change. Doing so without reservation will show that we are a council that listens and engages in everything that we do. And Chair, I think it's also important to know the way that our party is changing with a fresh new team leading Labour within the city, showing that we're determined to do politics differently, listening and learning in every decision that is taken and taking the city forward together. It's now time that we get on with the job before us. Councillor Nance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully now we can learn from the past and move ahead. We understand and fully agree with the local recommendations. We are committed to the new leadership and I agree with Councillor Hunt. Apologies without actions are meaningless. Um, so today, so I'm pleased to see the 36 actions in the report which directly address the recommendations and the lessons set out by the inquiry report. I look forward to the updates. However, when considering future projects on the scale of the Streets Ahead programme, one thing I would like to request is training, training that officers and councillors receive to scrutinise large contracts. As you can appreciate, not everyone has the capacity to review detail or ask the right questions. And I would like to request that we have a consist consistent approach across the council to ensure that we learn lessons and move forward to mitigate these in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll ask for reflections and, and answers on those points. And then I've got Councillor Agencia and Councillor Williams who've indicated. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, just to, um, to take Councillor Belbin's prompt um, and to reiterate absolutely the point around the potential of the city goals work, I think what's also really important about this work is that the council isn't leading it from the town hall. We're part of a, we're standing alongside partners in the city um, we're supporting it, but we're not driving it. We're recognising that actually it will take a, a really diverse range of voices from all across the city to define and imagine the sort of future city as brilliant as Sheffield needs to have. So for anybody that uh, hasn't engaged in the city goals work, I would just want to really encourage anybody watching to do so. There'll be lots of opportunities, but in the first instance, uh, we're gathering information both through, as, as uh, Councillor Belbin's mentioned, um, collaborative conversations facilitated in uh, all over the city um, and supported by Voluntary Action Sheffield, but also an open um, electronic survey that's open to um, anybody in the city to participate in, and we'll make sure that information is shared. Uh, it's, it's pretty prominent on the, on the website. Um, the um, question around, um, I, th I think I didn't, I'm not sure there was a question in Councillor Miskell's statement, but thank you for support um, in that. And Councillor Naz, I could not agree more around training. I think it's incredibly important. There, there is a, a mention in the report um, around the need for uh, us to refresh our understanding of what training is needed for both officers and members. Um, I think your point, particularly around very complex financial commercial um, arrangements, is, is a very good one. Um, equally, I think um, there is uh, an argument for us to do look at far more training around for officers around community engagement and how we and how we support the the um, the open and, and transparent discussions that we want to have with a very diverse range of, of folks all around the city. So um, we'll make sure those um, uh, that commitment to training is in there and um, that's in the actions. But we'll um, expect to come back with an update on that in the in the first six month update. I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Agency. Thank you, and thank you for um, for the report and the, you know the presentation and everything. My, um, I want to go back to the engagement um, and um, the need really for consistency uh, across all committees uh, in all parts of the uh, the council. I'm sure that we do a lot more engagement that we are even aware of, and that officers will engage with groups. But I wonder whether there is a way to not so much formalize it, but make it more consistent. Uh, and again, going back to the, the point that Council Nas made about training, particularly for the chairs, the deputy chair and the spokespeople on, um, on each committee in how to ensure that we do engage with the groups across the city, particularly the seldom heard 
and a minoritized one um, that we are really not very good at consulting um, properly and co-producing with. Um, and it shouldn't really be left to, um, to chance, uh, you know, that particular chair or that particular deputy chair mentioning a group. It should be more kind of um, strategic because it, only when we engage properly with our communities, we will get to really good policies and, um, and you know, and, you know, making a better uh, city for everybody, for all our citizens. Um, and I agree, we do need more um, training, particularly for members, particularly for the financial side, because we're just, you know, presenting members with financial information and not everybody is actually able to read that financial information. But going back to the groups, I think maybe do like um, a, a survey of what we already do and who we already engage with and then see where the gaps are and ask our members in your community who have we missed on this list uh, and then we can go to officers and say can you think of anybody else um, I was at a meeting last week um, speaking to Olivier from Sadaka um, and you know, there's lots of other groups and people always say we want to help just call on us we want to help people have got so much expertise and we, we you know we're making our work harder by not getting these people engaged properly thank you uh, i've got councillor williams and then councillor smith uh, thank you chair yeah um i wasn't a resident of sheffield when the, the council started its campaign for chopping down healthy trees um but i and so that gives me an insight which kate's mentioned that i look at it from a slightly different perspective from people who were here and i get it and i've listened to the questioners uh, and I, can, I have great sympathy and respect for your, and thank you for your question for the, what was going on. So I've really used the, uh, the LOCOP report to form most of my thoughts. And it's quite clear that there was virtually no checks and balances going on, controlling the council, heading down a certain route. And I think one of the key things going forward is there have to be checks and balances that we are addressing what we said we're going to address. And I'm really pleased that there are two dates, December the 20, 23 and July 24, where our actions will be accountable. I think the other thing, though, and it's, been, it's not just about us in this room today, it's about all 84 individual members. They've got to take responsibility for if they see something that they're not happy with, to raise it, either through the committee system or through their groups or whatever, but it's got to be done. They have a responsibility, and to the wider public as well, they have a responsibility to make sure the council can't get away with this again. Thank you. Thank you. Council Smith. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, at, at the risk of sounding a, a negative note, I appreciate and, and agree that the council has learnt lessons and changed. Um, in response to the tree report. But I just wonder whether, you know, we're focusing on the big stuff. For me, we can say the council has really changed if those lessons have been learned and percolate down to other activities that may be on a different scale. So, for example, without naming them, because I think this, that would deflect the conversation, you know, there have been other projects where there's been a huge amount of public comment, negative comment, sometimes outrage. And I've just sat there thinking, hang about, have we made a mistake there? Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of learning needs to be reflected everywhere, not just on the big stuff. You know, one of the things we can't do anymore is just keep plowing on, saying everything's going well, when patently it isn't. That's a we're not doing our jobs properly, and we're not serving the people of Sheffield properly when that happens. So we have to learn the mistakes in everything we do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Um, comments uh, and reflections from the panel? 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Lucy to speak to Councillor Argentio and Councillor Williams' points, if that's all right, and then I'll come back to Councillor Smith on your final point. Thank you. Um, so I completely agree about everything that you've said about a culture of participation. That sort of culture of participation is really built when you have a very clear vision across councillors, across senior management about what is needed, how it's going to be achieved, and what are the different ways in which that's going to be possible and appropriate in different services, which is what Councillor Belvin was alluding to there. You also, as a council, we all need to have the capacity to do it. Um, it is a very particular skill set to be able to go and engage with all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds and make sure that you're doing so in a thoughtful way and in a way which is going to um, not only allow the council to reach them, but for them to actually genuinely feel that they have been heard and that they are confident that what they have said will feed into the way the council does its business. Um, that is as true as officers as it is of members and I'm really grateful for the way that you've highlighted learning and development there as something which we need to think about now, but um, consistently. Those two things are probably more challenging to do than the creation of the right tool. And the right tool will be different depending on what you want to do at different, different times in different places. And you'll probably have to change and morph your, your approach over time. But it, if the report here aims to set out a way to sort of get this council to ask itself strategic, challenging questions and integrate that real emphasis on engagement across um, everything that we do. Um, thank you for your reflections on accountability. I completely agree. So you'll notice that the report doesn't recommend a sort of tree-specific board to monitor these things. It's exactly so. These actions, these recommendations are integrated into the um, boards and committees which monitor the entirety of the council's behaviour. Um, I think at the inquiry's public hearings, um, one of the former councillors commented that it could have been an inquiry into all manner of different things. Um, so, and that really speaks to how every service, every facet of the council needs to learn from these things. So we get that culture of reflection. Um, that's again something which is set from the top as well as sort of developed um, within each service. So I hope that um, the way that these align to the different committees which you all lead will enable you to make sure that, that that happens in the way in which you in which you want to see it. Thanks. And uh, finally, just um, Councillor Smith to pick up on your point. I think you're, you are absolutely right to highlight that in running a very, in a very large organisation in a complex city dealing with possibly the most challenging set of circumstances that many societies have ever, ever dealt with, we are going to need to adopt an approach of balance um, humility and the ability to uh, be brave enough to say when we think we haven't got something right and stop and, and, re, re, um, and reassess um, and do things differently. And if there are circumstances where that's necessary, obviously we have audit um, in the council. We, we do, I think, through the committee system, have really much stronger checks and balances and, um, and focus and attention on the conversation, the decisions before um, before members, and I think um, I'll sort of slightly take this point to to suggest that I think that this paper itself, um, the level of depth and um, the level of um, coverage that that has gone into this and the work that's gone into this, I think, are something that I, I would I would wager would not have happened had we not been had the benefit of a committee system and the openness that that that, that brings, and I'm um, really happy that we've got that. Um, I also think it's really important we recognise that we will sometimes get things wrong. I think I said this uh, when we had the very first SNR uh, meeting right after um, Sir Mark published his report. If we are naive enough to think we're going to get things right all the time, first time, then we won't do anything. And this city also needs us to um, be the best council we possibly can be. For our, our staff need us to be the best leaders we possibly can be. Um, and uh, the city goals will, I'm sure, set out some very ambitious and challenging um, goals and missions for us to contribute to as a key partner and leader in, in the city of Sheffield. So I think it's just about us creating that balance so that we're unafraid to say if we need to change um, tack and that people don't feel that they'll be, um, uh, you know, face undue harm as a result of that, um, that we're prompt when we do it, but we're also brave about making decisions when we need to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have before us then a report which contains recommendations for approval 
and you know, there's been a, a good discussion of the report today and I thank the officers for presenting it. Um, I think today's discussion, today's meeting has demonstrated the value of having many voices in the room. And I agree that we probably wouldn't be here without the system of governance that we now have. So the report um, in front of us, learning from the past and moving ahead, contains a number of recommendations. Um, are we all agreed with those recommendations? If any member wishes to dissent, please raise your hand. Okay. Well then, that report is agreed unanimously. And what today has demonstrated is that this is by no means the end of this process. It is the beginning of a long journey to now embed that culture of engagement, to implement all those 36 actions, and there's a lot of work to do, and it starts now with that unanimous agreement from this committee for the report. I'd like to say thank you to Lucy in particular for preparing the report and all of her work over the um, last uh, few months and years on, on this uh, body of work which has led us to today. So thank you very much, Lucy. Um, and thank you all today. Thank you to the members of the public for joining us and thank you to everyone who's watching online. Um, and that concludes the meeting.